Bon a la calme, mes amours. Today, the House Judiciary Committee held a three-hour hearing with the heads of global policy at Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube in order to address filtering and censorship. I wasn't able to stream this due to health reasons, but I've taken the time to make a two-part digest, annotated with timestamps and covering the most interesting and on-topic questions provided by the committee, as well as the answers provided, so you are able to see this for yourself. I think this is a very important discussion that needs to be had within Congress and by the world at large, though many of the members of the committee would disagree with me and use their time to essentially filibuster and condemn the president. These rants by representatives Raskin, Nadler, Johnson, Cicilline, Liu, Jeffries, and uh, Jayapal have been removed for the sake of sticking to the topic. That said, this video still rounds out to about two hours, so I'm splitting it into two parts. If there's a specific congressman or congresswoman whose questions you'd like to hear, you can find links to those timestamps in the description box below. Time of the gentleman has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Bass, for five minutes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and I also want to thank my colleague, Representative Deutsch, for allowing me to go out of order. Um, there's been an awful lot of discussion and questions today about um, social media and conservatives, but uh, I wanted to ask, uh, particularly Mr. Bickert, Ms. Bickert, um, about over, -cens over censorship of activists on the left as well, and what is Facebook doing to address disproportionate censorship of people of color on the platform. And, and an example is over the last few years, multiple well-known black activists have had their content removed, our accounts banned for speaking out about racial injustice. And what is your plan to ensure that voices like this are not silenced on your platform? Thank you, Congresswoman. It is so important to us that we are a platform for all of these voices. We know that at our scale, we have billions of posts every day, and we, we review more than a million reports every day. We know that we sometimes will make uh, mistakes, and sometimes those mistakes have affected activists. Uh, one of the things that we're doing is offering appeals so that if we get a decision wrong, people can ask us to take a second look, and we will. That is live now. We're continuing to uh, increase the robustness of the appeals process, but that is something that we... Uh, something that we rolled out after talking to many of these groups. How would a person know about the appeal? So in other words, if you remove content, then you, do you send a message saying we that do. you can appeal? So if somebody posts something on Facebook and we remove it, we send a notification, and then that gives them the opportunity to say, Facebook, I think you got it wrong, and then and we will take another When did you start look. doing this? We began, well, uh, let me be clear. We did have appeals for pages and groups and profiles for years. But in early May, late April, early May of this year, we began offering appeals for when somebody has a post or a photo removed. By the end of this year, we're hoping to have this um, also available for if you've reported something to us and we have failed to remove it and you think it should be removed. That's one thing we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're also talking to um, a number of groups directly and that's uh, something that we, we do with groups across the political spectrum and around the world to understand mistakes that we've made and how our policies affect them. And we've also hired Laura Murphy, prominent civil rights attorney, um, and a law firm, uh, Relman, civil rights law firm, to do a comprehensive assessment of how our policies and our practices um, affect civil rights. So maybe some of the activists that had their um, sites removed are not aware of that. So, you know, Facebook might consider taking another look at that for some of the groups that have had their sites removed. Thank you, Congressman. Um, what is Facebook doing to prevent Russians from pretending to be black activists and buying ads targeting black users? You remember that, the um, ads that went out really to discourage African Americans from voting, and then the pretend sites uh, that seemed as though they were from black activists, but they were not. Congresswoman, there are two primary things we're doing. The first is we've gotten a lot better at removing fake accounts like those that, were, that the Russian IRA had on Facebook. Those were inauthentic accounts. We should have caught them sooner, but they always violated our policies. We've now gotten much better at finding those accounts. The second thing we're doing is requiring transparency around political and issue ads in the United States such that now, if you see an ad on Facebook about a political um, issue, you can see who has paid for that ad. You can also see any ads that a particular entity 
um, is running by going to their page and clicking on a button that will take you to their ads library, even if you haven't been targeted with any of the ads. You mentioned the, uh, um, a woman that was working with you from Civil Rights uh, Arena, and um, you announced that there was a civil rights review that would evaluate how the platform impacts people of color, and specifically, what is the audit looking at? Uh, we want to make sure that the policies that we have are being enforced consistent with civil rights, so we need to understand how these policies are affecting all these different communities. We're hopeful that what we learn from this assessment and from the audit will help us become a better platform that will respect voices across the political spectrum. So since you're receiving so much criticism today, let me just uh, end by thanking Facebook, actually, for never taking down memorial pages uh, for people who've passed away, even for years and years after they've passed away. I appreciate that. I would the gentleman you. yield? Yes. I just want to follow up with a question. Uh, Ms. Bickard made a comment again about the ability to now requiring that uh, a campaign uh, have to disclose who's paying for the ad, which I think is a good thing. Um, and I wanted to follow up, I asked earlier about whether uh, you also disclosed the rates. Now with television or radio, uh, an opposing campaign, I guess the media can probably check and find out what the rates are. Can you do that with Facebook too? If the opposing campaign sees a lot of Facebook advertising, can they find out the rate, see if their rate is comparable to the rate that uh, for the ad that they're seeing disclosed? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the way that Facebook ads pricing works through an auction model is something that's uh, fairly complex, and I'm afraid I'm, I'm probably not the best equipped to explain the details of that, but we can certainly follow up with you. And yeah, we'll up. follow up, and I, I do would like to know more about that. Will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chair recognized gentleman from Texas. Actually, I have a unanimous consent request, too, uh, and you may want to comment on this if anybody allows you time. I, I just want to put this in the record. Asia Times, June 2, 2018, is Facebook helping Vietnam suppress online dissent? Uh, without objection, that will be made a part of the record. The gentleman from Texas, Mr. Smith, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Americans deserve the facts objectively reported. They know media bias is pervasive. A recent morning consult poll found that only a quarter of voters now trust the media to tell them the truth, a record low. The media savages the president and portrays his administration in the worst possible light. Over 90% of his network news coverage has been negative, higher than any other president. The muting of conservative voices by social media also has intensified. Social media companies have repeatedly censored, removed, or shadow banned conservative journalists, news organizations, and media outlets that do not share their liberal political views. Facebook's new algorithm for what users see on their timeline has disproportionately harmed conservative publishers. They're getting fewer readers, while their liberal counterparts haven't been impacted to the same degree. Recently, Google's employees easily convinced the company's management to cut ties to contracts with the military. And Google has long faced criticism from fact checkers over manipulating search results to slight conservatives. Google has also deleted or blocked references to Jesus, Chick-fil-A, and the Catholic religion. When will it stop? Also alarming are the guidelines being written by these companies to define hate speech. Facebook's newly published community standards, which determines what content is allowed, define these terms for the American people. It violates Facebook rules, quote, to exclude or segregate a person or group, end quote. So a conservative organization, for example, calling for illegal immigrants to be returned to their home country could be labeled a hate group by the platform and their content removed altogether. Some platforms have allowed liberal interest groups to determine what information is available to the public. The Southern Poverty Law Center is allowed to influence platform guidelines and sometimes censor content that they deem hate speech. The SPLC has a hate map that list over 900 organizations. These include pro-life, religious freedom, and border security groups, all popular with the American people. And they are unfairly targeted by the SPLC. It's no secret that social media organizations are typically controlled and run by individuals who lean liberal, sometimes radically so. It will require a constant effort by these entities to neutralize this relentless bias 
if, in fact, they really want to do it. All media entities should give the American people the facts, not tell them what to think. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask all of our panelists today one question uh, that's pretty direct and I think can be answered yes or no. And the question is this, would you pledge publicly today to make every effort to neutralize bias within your online platforms? And Ms. Bigert, we'll start with you. Congressman, we're making those efforts now. There is no place for bias on Facebook. Thank you. Ms. Downs? Yes, we design products that for, are for everyone, and we enforce our policies in a politically neutral way. And you feel every effort should be made to try to neutralize the bias? Correct. That's we correct. design our algorithms to okay. check for bias. Thank yes. you. Mr. Pickles? I think you're right to highlight that people have biases when they come to work, and our focus, as you say, should absolutely be on making sure that bias is not a factor and that our rules are enforced impartially. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Does the gentleman yield? Uh, yes, be happy to yield the balance of my time to the chairman. I, I wonder, Ms. Bickard, are you familiar with the, the uh, story about the contention that Facebook's uh, content uh, filtering practices, which as has been testified here earlier, comply with, quote, local law, is, is effectively censoring uh, free speech in, in Vietnam? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I can speak to how we respond to requests under local law. If we get a request from a government uh, telling us that speech is illegal, the first thing that we do is see if that speech complies with our community standards. If it doesn't, then we will remove it. If it does comply with our standards but is nevertheless illegal, we will look at uh, the legal request that we've received. Our legal team will look at the requesting authority, the process itself, who was affected by the speech, any human rights implications, uh, and then we will make a decision about whether or not we should restrict content in accordance with that local law. If we do, then we remove that content only in the jurisdiction where it is illegal, and we report on that in our government transparency report. I do want to emphasize that this is very different from us providing data to a foreign government. There is a process through which governments can ask us for data, like an FBI search warrant, let's say, and our legal team analyzes those. But I think you mentioned that the article was about Vietnam. We do not store data in Vietnam. Uh, they can rec they can present legal process to us. If they do, we will scrutinize that. And you can see from our government transparency report that those requests from Vietnam are very low and we don't comply with all of them. I'd ask unanimous consent to put into the record a letter uh, sent by a bipartisan uh, group uh, this week on the issue in Vietnam to both uh, Facebook and uh, Google. Without objection, that would be made a part of the record. Chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Deutsch, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there was an interesting article in this morning's Wall Street Journal entitled, Publishing Executives Argue Facebook is Overly Deferential to Conservatives. Uh, Ms. Bickert, I just wanted to follow up on what you had talked about earlier. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the review that's being led by uh, former Senator John Kyle, uh, along with the Heritage Foundation, about what uh, uh, many articles recently pointed out as unsubstantiated claims of anti-conservative bias. But the question is, you put this together, uh, they're conducting this review. After the review started, my understanding is that the RNC chair, Ronald McDaniel, and Brad Parscale, the campaign manager for the president's re-election campaign, then doubled down on the narrative, complained of suppression of, con of conservative speech. And rather than pointing to this review that's taking place, Instead, there were meetings immediately scheduled between the head of the RNC, the president's re-election campaign, and high-ranking officials at Facebook. Is that right? I'm, I'm afraid I don't, I don't know about that. I could uh, follow, have our I, team follow up. If you could up. just follow up on that and get back to us, we would appreciate it. Um, I represent Parkland, Florida, and in this discussion of, of social media, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the, the savage attacks on the student survivors of Stoneman Douglas. One of the most virulent strains of these attacks was that the students didn't survive a school shooting, that they were crisis actors, uh, that they were planted by some mysterious cabal to finally get Congress to do something about gun violence. And in the weeks after the shooting, Alex Jones's YouTube channel posted a video uh, that was seen by 2.3 million subscribers, alleging that these were merely 
uh, <coughs> that these were actors and not real students who had experienced the most horrific thing anyone could possibly imagine. The video violated YouTube's rules against bullying and it was removed. An article posted to Slate.com describes this as a strike against the channel. Ms. Downs, um, how many strikes does a channel get? Typically a channel gets three strikes and then we terminate the channel. So uh, the reason I ask is Alex Jones obviously is a well-known conspiracy theorist, theorist whose brand is bullying. He launched similar attacks against the families whose six and seven-year-old kids were slaughtered at Sandy Hook. Uh, and he's not the only one. Truthers have spread these lies claiming that Sandy Hook never happened at all. In the Slate article references a study by Jonathan Albright, director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia, who found 9,000 videos on YouTube with titles that are, and I quote, a mixture of shocking, vile, and promotional themes that include rape game jokes, shock reality, social experiments, celebrity pedophilia, false flag rants, and terror-related conspiracy theories dating back to the Oklahoma City attacks in 1995. Ms. Downs, does Google think that this is a problem, and what is the solution that you're coming up with to address it? Thank you for the question. So as you noted, uh, when Alex Jones posted the video you described saying that the survivors of the Parkland massacre were crisis actors, that violated our harassment policy. We have a specific policy that says if you say a well-documented violent attack Understand. didn't happen, and you use the name or image of, of survivors or victims of that attack, that is a, a malicious attack and it violates our policy. In terms of conspiracy theory content generally, our goal is to promote authoritative content to our users. So we have two principles that guide the way here. That's the first one, is we want to provide users with authoritative, trustworthy Ms. Downs, information. I, I'm sorry to cut you off, I only have a minute and a half, and I, I, I don't really need to hear what you're trying to provide. I wanna know how you're dealing with all these conspiracy theorists on your platform. So the, the first way is by demoting low quality content and promoting more authoritative content. And the second is by providing more transparency for users. So we're introducing boxes that provide factual information at the top of results that have shown themselves to turn up a lot of information that is counterfactual, such as searching for the earth is flat on YouTube, where you see a lot of- Your response is to put a box saying, nope, the earth is not flat. Correct. Okay, I have a question, Ms. Bickard, for you. You recently decided not to ban InfoWars. Can you explain that decision? And do you use a strikes model like YouTube? Uh, Congressman, we do use a strikes model. Uh, what that means is if a page or a profile or a group is posting content and some of that violates our policies, we always remove the violating posts at a certain point, and it depends, the, it depends on uh, the nature of the content that is violating our policies. At a certain point, we would also remove the page or the profile or the group at issue. Right. So the question is, how many strikes does a conspiracy theorist who attacks grieving parents and student survivors of mass shootings get? How many strikes are they entitled to before they can no longer post those kinds of horrific attacks? I want to be very clear that allegations that survivors of a tragedy like Parkland are crisis actors, that violates our policy and we remove that content. And we would remove, we would continue to remove any violations from the InfoWars page. If they uh, posted sufficient content that it, it violated our threshold, the page would come down. That threshold varies depending on the severity of different types of violations. Thank you. I yield back. The chair recognizes the gentleman from uh, Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Downs, you mentioned in your opening statement or, or sometime in the beginning that there was only limited activity on your side from some of the Russian trolls and some of these uh, entities. Is that correct? That is correct. What did you mean by limited activity? Pursuant to our investigation around the 2016 election, we found two accounts that had a spend of less than $5,000 in advertising and 18 YouTube channels with just over 1,000 videos in, in English that we terminated um, as soon as we identified them. Those were all linked to the Internet Research Agency. Okay, Mr. Pickles, do, would you consider it limited activity that happened on Twitter? 
Um, we have 336 million users um, as a proportion of that. Yes, this was a small proportion, uh, but the accounts we believe that were linked to the Internet Research Agency uh, did run to several thousand. Uh, that was too many, uh, and we've taken steps to make sure they so can't. So there were millions of users, and there were several thousand uh, of these ac uh, yes, accounts. Uh, Ms. Uh, is Bickert, uh, what about on Facebook? Congressman, we have more than 2 billion people using this site every month, and we had uh, fewer than 500 pages, groups, and accounts. So what all three of you are telling us is that the Democrats' campaign was so weak that this limited activity apparently influenced the elections and caused the United States to actually choose the wrong uh, person for president. Is that what you're telling us? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. I yield the rest of my time to uh, the current chairman of the the committee. <laughs> I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Pickles, is it your testimony or your viewpoint today that Twitter is an interactive computer service pursuant to Section 230, Sub C1? Um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, so I won't want to speak to that, but I understand that under two, Section 230, we are protected by that, yes. So, so if, you're, if two, Section 230 covers you, and that section says, no provider or user of interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by another. Is it your contention that Twitter enjoys a First Amendment right under speech while at the same time enjoying Section 230 rights? Uh, well, I think we've discussed the way that the First Amendment interacts with our companies. As private companies, we enforce our rules, uh, and our rules prohibit a range of activities. I'm not asking about your rules. I'm asking about whether or not you believe you have First Amendment rights. You either do or you do not. Uh, I'd, like, well, I'd like to follow up on that, because as, as someone who's not a lawyer, um, I think that's a very well, that's, important Well, question. you're the senior public policy yes, absolutely. official for Twitter before us, and, and you will not answer the question whether or not you believe your company enjoys rights under the First Amendment? Uh, well, I believe we do, but I, I would like to confirm okay. with colleagues. So, so, so what I want to understand is, if you say, I enjoy rights under the First Amendment, and I'm covered by Section 230, and Section 230 itself says, no provider shall be considered the speaker, do you see the tension that that creates? Uh, yes, but I also see that uh, Congress, we've worked with previously to identify why it's important to remove content that is of child sexual abuse and why it's important. Okay, well, to let's let's content. explore some of those extremes then. Hypoth I know Twitter would never do this. I'll disclaim that. But could Twitter remove someone from their platform because they're gay or because they're a woman? Uh, well, we would remove someone breaking our rules, and that behavior is not prohibited under our rules. So it's your contention that Twitter does not have the ability then to remove someone because they're gay or because they're a woman? Uh, as I say, that context is not part of the context of whether they break our rules. Okay, well, Jared Taylor is a horrible human being who you're currently litigating with, but that litigation seems to, the, te the transcript from it seems to have some tension with what you're telling Congress. The court in that litigation asked the question, does Twitter have the right to take somebody off its platform uh, it, because it doesn't like the fact that the person is a woman or gay? And the response from the attorney for Twitter was, the First Amendment would give Twitter the right, just like it would give a newspaper the right to choose to not run an op-ed from someone because she happens to be a woman. Would Twitter ever do that? Absolutely not, not in a million years. Does the First Amendment provide that protection? It absolutely does. So was your lawyer correct in that assessment, or were you correct when you just said that that, that would not be permitted? Uh, well, I'm not familiar with the facts of that case, and I, I can appreciate I can't comment on ongoing litigation, uh, but this is absolutely a critical public policy issue, uh, one that's important we debate, because as our companies seek to reassure you in this committee of the way that we take our decisions in a neutral way uh, and not taking into account political beliefs, uh, I think that the fact our rules are public and that we are taking steps to improve the transparency of how we improve the enforcement of those rules are important steps to take. Right, but it is not in service of transparency if your company sends executives to Congress to say one thing, that, that you would not have the right to engage in that conduct, and then your lawyers in litigation say precisely the opposite. That serves to frustrate trans transparency. But my time has expired. The gentleman from Rhode Island, Mr. Cicilline, is recognized for five minutes. So, Ms. Bickett, I'll start with you. My question is, I've introduced legislation to ensure fairness and an even playing field between publishers and dominant platforms such as Facebook. Uh, this bill provides for a limited safe harbor for news publishers to band together for purposes of negotiating branding, attribution, and inoperability of news. What objections does Facebook have to collective bargaining by news publishers to promote access to trustworthy sources of news? And um, second question is, 
Facebook and other companies are required by Article 20 of the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation to give consumers the ability to take their data from Facebook to a competing service. Why has Facebook not made this right available to American users? And does Facebook oppose giving American consumers the right to uh, move their data to competing services like you do as part of this uh, agreement with the European Union? Thank you, Congressman. We definitely support data portability. In fact, we've had that in place for years, and the services that we apply, that we offer in Europe for data portability, we are also offering um, similar options for users in the United States, and we have offered such options for years. Um, that means that people can take their data with them from Facebook to another service. Um, I would note that when we hear concerns from any community on Facebook, whether it is news publishers or whether it is people on the right or people on the left, we want to make sure that we understand those concerns are responsive to them. We always want to apply our policies fairly to all of these groups. That's the reason that we are um, undertaking various audits and assessments. We just want to make sure that we're doing our job right and that we're understanding if our policies are, in fact, being applied as fairly as we intend for them to be. We can always do better. The gentleman's time has expired. Can she be committed to answer the first question? I think that's... Well, I, I, we've gone a minute over, Mr. Cicilline, so I'm going to recognize the gentleman. Then, Mr. Unanimous Chairman, I have a unanimous five. consent request. Uh, gentleman's recognized make his unanimous consent request. I request unanimous consent to enter the following materials into the record, a 2017 report by Newswhip an internet analytics firm on the rise of hyperpolitical media, an article in Neiman Labs entitled, Has Facebook's Algorithm Change Hurt Hyperpartisan Sites? According to this data, nope. And an article by April Glazer and Slate entitled, Facebook Won't Make the Bed It Lies In. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you for being here. I know this is a difficult uh, subject area. Uh, prior to my election to Congress, I was a constitutional law attorney and I litigated free speech cases in the courts for almost 20 years defending religious liberty and the First Amendment. And so, I'm very wary of, of censorship efforts. Sometimes they're well intended, but there's always a high degree of subjectivity and it causes problems. And I'm still trying to understand what standards each of your organizations uh, utilize to determine exactly how offensive or controversial or fake content is defined. And as you've noticed, many of us have come in and out of the hearing because we have other things going on. If you've answered some of these, I apologize in advance. But this is a, a, a question that I think my constituents back home really want to know because they ask me this all the time. How do each of your companies define fake news? Let me start with Ms. Bickert. Thank you, Congressman. Um, first, I want to say that we actually published a new version of our standards in April that gives all of the detail of what we tell our content reviewers in, in terms of how to apply our policies against things like hate speech or bullying and so forth. We also include in there a section on what we're doing to combat false news. It is not against our policies, meaning we don't remove the content just for being false. What we do instead is we try to provide, if we have an indication that a news story is false, and that would be because it's been flagged as potentially being false, and then we've sent it to third-party fact checkers um, who have rated it false, then we will provide additional information to people who see that content. And that will be related articles from around the internet. We will also try to counter any virality of that post by uh, reducing its distribution. Okay. Ms. Downs. Our goal is to provide our users with trustworthy information that's responsive to what they're looking for. So how do you define fake news? Fake news is obviously a term used to describe a spectrum of content. So at one end of the spectrum, you have malicious, deceptive content that's often being spread by troll farms, et cetera. That content would violate our policies, and we would act quickly to remove the content and or the, the accounts that are spreading it. In the middle, you have misinformation that may be low quality. This is where our algorithms kick in to promote more authoritative content and demote lower quality content. And then of course you even hear the term used to refer to mainstream media, in which case um, we, we do nothing. We don't embrace the term um, in, in that context. Well, let, me, let me ask you before I move to Twitter. If a content reviewer determines that something is fake news, is, is there an appeals process uh, for the, the person who produced that, in, that content? I mean, are, are they notified formally? Anytime we remove content for violation of our policies, the user is notified and given an, a link to an appeals form. How long does the appeals process take? I'm not familiar with the average turnaround times, um, but I could get back to you with that information. Well, I wish you would. I mean, the news cycle obviously is uh, constantly changing. So if the appeals process takes days or weeks, 
then it's a moot point by the end of that, that process. And our concern is, of course, that you would, any organization, any company, would filter things that they may or may not, or their internal reviewers may not agree with, and then by the time the appeals process is exhausted, it's stale content anyway, and, and if the objective was to pull it down and take it out of the public's view, then that was accomplished just because of the time delay. So there's a due process concern that we have, even though you're not the government, I mean, it still should apply here, I think. Um, our, let, me, let me ask you, I'm, I'm getting to Twitter next, but hold on. Uh, are individuals outside of your company consulted with regard to uh, appropriate content or the purveyors of the content? Our policies are developed by us, but we sometimes consult experts when we feel we need additional expertise to understand particular kinds of content. However, all enforcement decisions are made internally by the company. A, a controversy developed this year with regard to um, you guys uh, about the Southern Poverty Law Center, SPLC, and they labeled some mainstream Christian and conservative organizations as hate groups because they didn't like what they were doing. Uh, and then Google and YouTube used the SPLC designation, at least allegedly, to flag the content of those groups. I mean, did that happen? Do you admit that that happened? So that reference is to a program that we call the Trusted Flagger Program, which is one where we engage NGOs and government agencies with expertise on the particular kinds of things we prohibit per policy. They get access to a bulk flagging tool so they can flag videos to us in bulk rather than one at a time. They do not have any authority to remove content, restrict content, or demote content on our services. All of those decisions are made by us. So we're leveraging their expertise, but decision-making authority is retained by the company. I guess this goes to the appeals process, but I mean, some of these groups I know personally are legitimate, well-respected, faith-based organizations, and, and I just want to say SPLC is not a neutral watchdog organization, so I'm glad to know they don't get editorial control, but I think some of that needs to be looked at. I got two seconds. I didn't get to get to Twitter, but I appreciate you all being here. I'll, I'll yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> what, um, Ms. Bigger, what, what percentage of digital advertising market does, does Facebook have? Uh, Congressman, I, I can say that uh, advertising, I know, is in the United States a $650 billion industry. We have about 6% of that. 6% of the six, on the, and just on the digital platform, though. I'm not talking advertising in general. I, uh, I don't have an exact statistic on that. Sorry. We how can about, follow up on that. How about you, Ms. Downs? I'd have to follow up with that number as well. Mr. Pickles? Uh, I can follow up on that. Because it's been reported that it's like, Somewhere around three quarters of all digital advertising marketing is dollars are with, with the three of you guys. Is that not accurate? That's the number I've heard. 75% of digital advertising market is controlled by Facebook, Google, and Twitter. That's not accurate? Ms. Biggert? Congressman, again, I know that we have about 6% of the overall advertising market, which is about $650 billion. Yeah, but that's not what I'm asking you. I'm not asking you overall, overall advertising market. I'm, I'm talking about the digital area. I, we're, I'd be happy to have our team follow up with you on that. Okay, if you could do that, would be fine. Ms. Biggert, in your opening statement, you talked about fake news. I think you called it false news. And uh, there's been discussions about third-party fact-checkers who assist you in determining what, in fact, is fake news or false news. Can you tell me how that process works at Facebook? Yes, Congressman, we do work with third-party fact checkers. All of them are approved, uh, they're pointer approved, and they are signatories to the International Fact Checking Network Code of Principles. Although they meet these high standards, we also wanna make sure that we are not, um, uh, we know this is not a perfect process. So, so how many are there? In the United States, I believe right now there are five currently. And that includes uh, groups like the AP and the Weekly Standard. Um, we are open for others. They can apply to. So do you use all five of those? The way the process works is if something is flagged as potentially false, it is sent to all five or all participating fact checkers. Right now, there, I believe there are five. Who flags it? If one of them, who flags it? It could either be from people reporting that content is false, or it could be from our technology um, noting that, for instance, in comments, people are saying that this content is false. So your, your system can flag it or someone can just send you some kind of message, say, hey, we think this is fake news. And if content is flagged as potentially being false, again, sent to these fact checkers. Now, if any one of the fact checking organizations, organizations rates the content as true, then the content is not downranked. But if they agree that this content is uh, so not true. So if all five say this is fake news, 
then what does Facebook do? We don't remove it, but we do reduce the distribution. And we also will uh, put related articles beneath the content so that people see other stories from around the internet that are on the same topic. Are these five entities who are making this determination, are they the same all the time? Are they the same five entities, or does this rotate, or how does, how, and who are these five entities? Tell me that. The entities include um, AP, the Weekly Standard, factcheck.org, um, and by the way, this list is, we are open to receiving additional fact-checking organizations. They can apply. Associated and Press, the Weekly these. Standard, factcheck.org, uh, and who else? Who are the other two? I, sorry. I'm not, I don't think so. PolitiFact, and there's one that I'm forgetting. Um, I can get these to you. These are public. We've, we've listed these five publicly. And if others apply, they will also, and they meet the standards, they will also be added. Okay, and then would it still be unanimous before this gets, gets downgraded or flagged on your, on your platform? Right now our practice is if any one organization flags it as true, then it will not be demoted. But of course, over time, we're learning from this process. We know it's not perfect right now. We will continue to iterate and get better on it. Okay, Ms. Downs, same, same question to you. How does it work for you guys, same way? We briefly introduced a fact check feature in our knowledge panels where the goal was to provide information um, about publishers so users have greater context in evaluating what they read. However, it was an experimental feature. We got some critical feedback that we felt was valid, so we put the feature on pause until we could fix those concerns and decide and who, whether to read it. And who, were the, who was the organizations doing it for you? Uh, I think that I, I would have to get back with you to you on the details, but I believe let anyone me go to where, who Let met, me go to where Mr. Johnson was just a few minutes ago. Was the Southern Poverty Law Center one of those entities in, in part of this third-party fact-checking operation? I do not believe so, no. Okay. Uh, committee, I, I, I just want to go back to some earlier statements um, by, by one of our colleagues across the aisle who, who uh, listen, I, I, I believe that this is an incredibly important hearing. The potential uh, censorship of, of free speech, I think, goes to the core of our country's freedoms. And to suggest that because we're not talking about some other items that are in the news, that somehow this is, quote, ridiculous when considered uh, in light of the, the, the balance between uh, free speech and public safety. When we look at what, what went on with Backpage, uh, the lives were, that were destroyed, the children that were trafficked, uh, the prostitution that was rampant. Uh, that, that's why this uh, hearing, I think, is so vitally important. And, and Ms. Pickard, I'd, I'd like to ask you, today citizens can hold newspapers and other media groups legally accountable if they knowingly lie, if they show indecent content, or if they use materials or photos that they are not authorized or did not pay to use, and so on. Technical platforms are currently uh, making in-depth decisions about what information users receive and how they receive it, often driven by financial and other unknown motives. And Mr. Zuckerberg himself has repeatedly said that his platform is, res quote, responsible for the content that they host. Should the tech platforms be subject to the same content regulations and civil penalties as those who produce the content? Thank you, Congressman. We do feel a sense of accountability and responsibility to make sure that Facebook is a place where people can come and be safe and express themselves. And that is at the core of everything we are trying to do. In terms of regulation, we are happy to uh, talk to this committee and others. We think that uh, there is a place for, uh, uh, for these conversations, and we hope that we could be a part of guiding any regulatory efforts. I'm very pleased to hear you say that. Your platform generates revenue based on ads, yet the content provided in, in some cases is illicit, which is, uh, in, why is it acceptable to, to Facebook, Google, Twitter, Bing, and, and others to make money off of illegal content while, other, while these other media outlets are held accountable, civilly and criminally, without, without the protection of 230, Section 230? Congressman, we do, uh, if content is brought to our attention that violates our policies or is illegal, we do have measures for removing that. And I would also note that we were supportive of uh, the, sex of the um, act to protect sex trafficking victims. That's something we care a lot about. If, in fact, uh, this Congress uh, and I believe the public are beginning to question the, the full uh, protections afforded under 
Section 230. And, and as you uh, just referenced, on April 11th of this year, the President signed into law an additional provision under 230 that declared that 230 does not limit a federal civil claim for conduct that constitutes sex uh, trafficking, a federal uh, criminal charge for conduct that constitutes sex trafficking, or a state criminal charge for conduct that promotes or facilitates prostitution. So my question is, those are two examples, trafficking and prostitution, that are now exemptions uh, to the protection under 230. Do you, do you see any other, and this is for the whole panel, do you see any other areas where uh, those kinds of exceptions to the protections under 230 should be examined? Let me throw out an example. How about sedition? Mr. Pickles, any comment? Well, I think we, we, we've, we've spent a lot of time talking about these issues today. And firstly, you're right to highlight the work that's been done to tackle child trafficking. Um, before the passage of that bill, we already had a zero tolerance approach to this. We work very closely with the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children uh, to help law enforcement bring to justice those people who are seeking to do harm to children. Um, we also take a range of actions under our rules that we think are the right thing to do. Our rules go far beyond um, what's required by law because this is, these are our rules that we set. So I've highlighted previously terrorist content that we are proactively taking down at speed and scale because we think it keeps our platform safe and it's the right thing to do. And I think the, the demonstration you're seeing is of companies who are responsible in taking the right You steps. think Congress should look at codifying that? Uh, well, I think, I think the, uh, the, the balance of regulation that we see... To have a rule is one thing. To have a law is another. Uh, Ms. Downs, what do you think? YouTube remains a service provider that hosts user-generated content um, at an unprecedented scale. We have a natural incentive to protect our product from harmful content, and we invest a lot of resources in enforcing our policies using both technology and human. The gentleman's Thank time you. has expired. Gentleman from Texas, Mr. Pose, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you all for being here. Um, just as a, as a note, the whole idea of now we are going to have corporations censor speech based upon their definition of fake news, based on their definition of hate speech, um, is opening up a, a Pandora's box. What one person may think is fake news, somebody else believes is the gospel truth. And we're gonna turn that over to a group of people to decide. Um, it's, it's gonna be, I think, uh, very chaotic. Are any of you familiar with uh, uh, the general data protection uh, requirements, regulations? Who's, is anybody familiar? Ms. Downs, are you familiar with it? Yes, I'm familiar with GDPR. Okay. And basically, if I'm correct, uh, it's now the uh, policy in the European Union that consumers must opt in to the dissemination of their private information uh, that is carried by one of your organizations. Is that a fair statement, Ms. Downs? There are consent requirements built into GDPR, yes. All right. And what do you personally think of uh, this regulation in Europe? We very much support a goal of protecting the privacy of our users, and we're, we are happy to continue to work with Congress on that here in the U.S., as we do with the European Union uh, for Europe. I agree with you. I think the privacy of most Americans and people, consumers, um, should be something looked at by uh, not only your companies but Congress so that the consumer is protected because we all know and have heard all of the stories about how our private, we think is private information, is not private at all. Uh, it's disseminated by your organizations uh, to people we don't even know uh, and so that um, citizens, users should at least know where that information is going to uh, and have the ability to opt into the dissemination of private information, not to mention all of the 
cyber attacks that take place uh, daily uh, by nefarious organizations. Uh, Mr. Pickles, did you want to say something? Uh, just, just to agree, I think privacy is, you're right, a defining uh, public policy issue. We have a global uh, privacy policy uh, for this reason. Uh, so while Europe has passed GDPR, uh, we think privacy is something important to all of our users all around the world. And you think that the United States Congress should look into that issue, working with all three of y'all and other people that are providers uh, uh, to come up with some privacy guidelines for consumers? Just your opinion, Mr. Pickles. I think that conversation's already started, and I'm absolutely right. I think it's one that Congress and industry uh, can engage on uh, to make sure that American citizens and indeed companies uh, strike that right balance. All right. Uh, Ms. Bickert, let me ask you this. What, I agree with you, Mr. Pickles. What is your definition of fake news? Uh, Congressman, we have a set of policies that are public that define everything that we are doing to counter fake news and how we so do it. So what is fake news? Just well, tell me your definition of fake news. Well, it really, it depends how people use that term. I mean, so it depends on what? What is fake news? You're, you said that you're going to try to keep it off of uh, all of these platforms. I'm not arguing with you, but what is fake news? No, we, we don't have a policy of removing fake news. You what just, we do, but you pointed out to individuals. What we do is if people have... Excuse me. I'm just trying to understand. If you think something is fake news, you have one of these five organizations, and Snoops is a left-wing organization, by the way. If you want to have one of these organizations tag it, what is it? What, or what are we talking about? It's we fake did, news. Congressman, what we do is if people flag content as being uh, false, or if our technology detects that comments or other signals suggest that content might be false, then we send it to these fact-checking organizations. If they rate the content as false and none of them rate it as true, then we will reduce the distribution of the content and add the related articles. So you let somebody else determine what fake news is and, and, and whatever their opinion of fake news is, but you don't have a definition of fake news? We do not, sharing information that is false does not violate our policies. All right, thank you. I yield back to the chair. The gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Jai Paul is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me associate my uh, remarks with uh, some of my colleagues earlier in saying that there are so many things we should be discussing, uh, particularly given the news of yesterday, given something that I've been fierce about, which is the separation of, of families. So many things. And I was pleased today, shocked, but pleased today to see that Chairman Goodlatte had said that Time and time again, this is his quote, that Russia will stop at nothing to interfere with and undermine our system of government. Just days ago, the Department of Justice announced more Russian nationals have been charged with attempting to interfere with the 2016 presidential election. This is not a country that can be trusted. I would urge Chairman Goodlatte to hold hearings on that very important topic. He seems to think it's a problem, and yet the Judiciary Committee that has jurisdiction over these issues has yet to hold a single hearing on election security, on protecting our democracy, on Russian hacking of our elections, um, and so I really hope that we do that. All of that said, um, I do think that there are some important issues raised here, and I think that in many ways this hearing and the questions that it raise, raises uh, are a tribute to the success of social media platforms. That's what's happened. Mark Zuckerberg, when he started Facebook, I don't think had any idea that it would take off, in the, or maybe he did, I think he didn't, but you know, that it would take off in the way that it has. And so the questions that are before you are critical and your responsibility and your actions and your timeliness around all of these issues is uh, absolutely essential to making sure that these platforms aren't misused and don't actually contribute to the detriment of our democracy. And I appreciate that there has been some work that all of your companies have done in trying to find the right answers, and I don't think it's easy. Um, I would like to just echo some of the comments that Mr. Raskin made and that Mr. Jeffries made about how Facebook ensures that it is not bending to the other side with the criticism that it gets. And I want to point out, um, I don't know if you're aware of this, Ms. Bickert, but I just saw a news article two days ago that Facebook has recently donated to Chairman Nunez, who, as you may know, is one of the leading voices that's fighting uh, Special Counsel Mueller's investigation into Russian interference in the 2016 election. Now, 
I understand that you, you donate to Democrats and Republicans. I have a bill that I am working on now that would not allow donations to members of a committee where there is an interest at stake. Why? Because I think it's important for there to be transparency and for the American public to understand that those donations don't affect how we look at issues. But are you concerned about the fact that Facebook has just in the last few weeks given money to an individual who is, invest who is countering the Russian investigation when you and Facebook are so deeply tied into what access the Russian government and, and Russian operatives were able to get to our elections? Thank you for the question, Congresswoman. I know that the Facebook uh, PAC does have bipartisan contributions. They are publicly disclosed. Were and you I, aware that, that Facebook has, the Facebook PAC donated to Chairman Nunez just in the last month, multiple times? I, I don't keep up to date on the details. Are of you concerned are. that that would, uh, that would taint the notion that Facebook really is trying to, to come to good solutions around these questions? Congresswoman, I know that we try to be very even-handed in the way that we donate, and we also make sure that um, we're very open about uh, our donations. I'd be happy to have a member of our team follow up with you on that. That would be great, because again, look, I, I know you donate to everybody. Um, I don't think that's right, that, but I know you donate to everybody, but I would just encourage you to look at this question of whether Facebook is bending too much to uh, appease some of our right-wing interests that I think are undermining our democracy. Let me go to this question of, of false news because I think the, the challenge here is that it is difficult to determine exactly what may qualify as false news, but the bigger problem to me is that we somehow get to a standard that truth is relative. Truth is not relative. An apple is an apple. It can't be a tomato tomorrow and a pear yesterday. It is an apple. And so the question for, for you is, in your strategy, you say that you do take uh, steps to try to not share false news, and yet, at the same time, you're saying you don't take down any pages. And I, I guess I just don't understand what the lines are here and how you're determining the broad guidance. Yes, there's a couple different things we do. One thing is we know that the majority, the biggest uh, amount of false news that you see on social media tends to come from spammers, financially motivated actors. And so we have technical means, that violates our policies, and we have technical means of trying to detect those accounts and remove them, and we've made a lot of progress in the past few years. Then there is this content that people may disagree about, or it may be widely alleged to be false. And we've definitely heard feedback that people don't want a private company in the business of determining what is true and what is false. But what we know we can do is counter virality by if we think that there is, um, that there are, are signals like third party fact checkers telling us that content is false, we can counter that virality by demoting a post and we can provide additional information to people so that they can see whether or not this article is consistent with what other mainstream sources around the internet are also saying. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes, and I'll, and I'll begin by associating myself with some of the comments from Mr. Liu and Mr. Raskin. When they indicate that the government should not foist upon the technology community the, um, you know, the over-regulation of the government, I completely agree. My question is, when you avail yourself to the protections of Section 230, do you necessarily surrender some of your rights as a publisher or speaker? The way I read that statute now, it's pretty binary. It says that you have to be one or the other. You have to be a, se a Section 230 protected, or you're a speaker with the full complement of your First Amendment rights. I'm cool with that. I would love you guys to make the choice. I come from the libertarian-leaning segment of my party. I just think it's confusing when you try to have it both ways, when you try to say that you know, we get these liability protections, but at the same time, we have the right to throttle content. We have the right to designate content. And, and in the most extreme examples, when you have a Twitter attorney saying in court, we would, we would never do this, but we would have the right to ban people based on their gender or their sexual orientation. So I wanted to clear up those comments. But um, my, question, my next question is for you, Ms. Bickert. Um, I've provided to you a screenshot I've taken from content that was published on Facebook from a page that is milkshakes against the Republican Party. There are two posts. Would you read the first one? And there is one naughty word there that you're welcome to skip over. <coughs> Would you
Will you read it aloud? Congressman, this is a post milkshakes against the Republican Party. Um, it has a picture and it says parents in the waiting area for today's school shooting in Florida. And then it says, you remember the shooting at the Republican baseball game. One of those should happen every week until those NRA, and then there are unpleasant words. Um, and then there's, I, I'm not sure if this is another post beneath it or not. Yeah, that's a second post. Will you read that? That has no naughty words. It says, dear crazed shooters, the GOP has frequent baseball practice. You really want to be remembered. That's how you do it. Signed, Americans tired of our politicians bathing in the blood of the innocent for a few million dollars from the terrorist organization NRA. Do these posts violate your terms of service? Uh, any call for violence violates our terms of service. So why but is Milkshakes Against the Republican Party a still alive page on your platform? I can't speak, I haven't reviewed this page. I can't speak to why any page is up or not up, um, but we can certainly so, follow up with it. So a member of my staff provided these comments to Facebook and we said, based on our reading of your terms of service and frankly based on your testimony today where you say we are committed to removing content that encourages real world harm. Based on that, this would be a facial violation, but I received back what I've provided to you and the highlighted portion of, of Facebook's message back to my staff includes, it doesn't go against one of our specific community standards. So do you see the tension between your public testimony today your terms of service, and then your conduct when you're presented with violent calls to shoot people who are members of my party at baseball practice. 